So our mission is to is sort of twofold. The events part is the cultivating feminist community and creating these fun events for people to sort of come together. And the other part is exploring feminist values in action. Welcome to the creators here at Sum City. Coming to you every Tuesday and Friday. Extended conversations that build community making for creators videos, by making, creators. making what you make. Today on The Creators, Crystal Paradis comes to an organization called Feminist Oasis after stints in marketing and political campaigns and organizing TEDx talks in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She brings all that experience with her and joins us to talk about events, feminism, and business. So we invite you to subscribe and... Give us a thumbs up. Well, you got to watch the show first. So let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome back to the creators of Some City. Bill Rogers here with guest Crystal Paradis. And Hello. <laughs> how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Crystal is the force behind the Feminist Oasis. That's feministoasis.com. And uh, she'll be talking about that as well as many other endeavors. So let's start uh, as we always do. Do you consider yourself a creator? And if so, does that term, uh, being a creator, does that mean anything in particular to you? I guess I do consider myself a creator. I've always been a writer and a photographer. That's definitely creating stuff. Um, and more recently, I'd say the past decade or so, been more of an organizer. So I definitely identify with the word organizer, which kind of is creating events and experiences, uh, campaigns and stuff like that for people. So yeah, I guess creator and creative sort of overlap to me. So anything creative, which is almost anything. Yeah. yeah I guess everybody's a creator. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say so. And um, in particular... Um, when I, when you and I spoke, I learned of your organization, the Feminist Oasis. Tell mm -hmm. me, what is the Feminist Oasis? Uh, Feminist Oasis is a, an experimental group right now. It's a business. It's, um, an organizing mechanism. So we organize pop-up events. So we don't have a location, but we, we organize events that happen in other locations, usually around exploring feminist ideas and feminist values in action. So one of our flagship events is a co-working event um, here in Summersworth at Teetotaler Cafe. We meet um, right now weekly. We've, we've done it bi-weekly. We've done it um, weekly off and on for different months. Um, but yeah, right now we're meeting on Tuesday mornings to do sort of co-working and we kick off every session with a workshop that talks about how to integrate feminist values into our businesses. Um, but we've also done really fun things like movie screenings and networking parties and really any excuse to get people together around a positive, fun idea and explore feminist values in action, uh, feminist historical leaders, um, feminists right here in your neighborhood that you might not have met, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the broad where, uh, events that you can come to right now is, is, I guess, the biggest thing in resources. Sure, sure. How do you define uh, feminism? And... One of the things that you mentioned, I was reading in your 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 blog, and you just mentioned it. You, you mm -hmm. find fun events to, uh, to 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 get people to just get into the get into yeah. whatever the activity is, and those are coming under this broad category of the feminist oasis. Mm -hmm. and how how do you define feminism? Feminism. Um, so there's a lot of different types of feminism. Um, so historically, it's been through what people categorize them into sort of waves of feminism and different. Um, historical eras of women's rights and stuff. The, the kind of feminism that um, we ascribe to is often referred to as intersectional feminism, which is a little jargony. It basically just means feminism that takes into account a lot of different experiences. So, um, for example, some of the first wave or two of feminism came under um, a lot of scrutiny for being very centered on white women's experience and particularly upper and middle class white women's experience, mm -hmm. mobility in the workplace and through careers. And so intersectional feminists like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and a lot of other feminist theorists came along and said, look, you have to take into account that black women's experience is different. We experience both racism and sexism. Um, also in the past, trans women were really excluded and left out of the conversation. And in fact, um, there was a lot of anti-trans 
language and sentiment in some of the earlier waves of feminism. So the word intersectional is sort of applied to a more modern version of feminism that says, look, whoever identifies as women and whatever other identities you have on top of that, you might be a woman of color or a disabled woman, we're sort of, we want equality for everyone, not just for um, a very narrowly defined. So in the short version, um, we would we would take bell hooks um, and I would modify it slightly, her definition of feminism, which is, um, a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation, and oppression for all people, for all genders. So thinking of, uh, of, of sort of a, a, uh, overcoming, uh, of addressing power uh, structures, and uh, when I think of, of sexism, I mm -hmm. think of power structures. I, yep. I, I think of a, a system that says, there are dominants and there are lessers, mm -hmm. whether that's explicit or not, but that seems to be behind it. Does that does that play into what you're doing in terms of this intersectional uh, feminism? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good aspect to focus on. And another thing we like to say um, is our, our type of feminism is not coming in saying we want women to now dominate men. <laughs> We're gonna flip the tables. Um, it's about really dismantling that unhealthy dynamic of one gender is better than another mm -hmm. type of a dynamic. So it's not, you know, all men must be dominated now and we're, we're taking over or anti-men, like a lot of people perceive feminism to be, this is about really leveling the playing field for everyone um, and it would, would equal the liberation of everyone. So, mm. you know, there's a lot of patriarchal, you know, masculinity things that, that a lot of men are held to that's totally unfair. I mean, sexism is really bad for everyone involved. So, mm -hmm. yeah, taking that approach of really dismantling unhealthy power structures, not reversing them. Mm -hmm. I was uh, reading one of your activities was how to paint and yeah. talking about <laughs> uh, fun activities. And so how does, how does doing a workshop or an event focused around painting address mm -hmm. the issue of... Uh, hegemony <laughs> of power structures, uh, and, and how does that focus on a fun activity? How does that how does that address the issue? Yeah, so that's sort of um, that's where the creativity comes in, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our art focus events was a, was a screen printing class, and so screen printing in and of itself might not necessarily be viewed as oh, this is a feminist activity, but the person who was teaching that class decided to bring in a little bit of historical knowledge on how something like screen printing really made the spreading of information, um, supporting movements like feminism and guerrilla art. Um, it made a, a very cheap and easy way to spread information and sort of um, similar to the printing press coming along and really opening up the democratic spread of information. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of applied an intersectional feminist lens to our screen printing workshop. So if you didn't care, didn't know anything about feminism and you showed up, you still learned how to screen print and you were screen printing and it was right. fun and fine, but you're also sort of getting this historical knowledge of like, oh wow, I never thought about before this came along. It wasn't as easy is easy to make a lot of cheap, fast reproductions of material for like a lot of feminist zines mm -hmm. back in the in the women's movement, like the riot girl zines that were made, mm -hmm. um, or even you know spreading of information about different events and different movements. So this is not an art form that has only supported feminism, but mm -hmm. let's focus this event on how it specifically relates to the movement of feminism. So we like to pick fun things like that where we're like, what could this have to do with feminism? And let's take that angle at, on our event. Mm -hmm. And I, I take it from your from your website. I think you're explicit about that. That that men are invited. That Absolutely. feminism is yep. not an exclusive activity <laughs> yep. for women. Yeah, we always say all genders are welcome to all of our events. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we have found that because the word feminist is in our business name, and the word feminism is all over sort of how we talk about our events, that we we don't often get inundated with a lot of men showing up so we have to really make that explicit that you know all genders are welcome men are completely welcome um like any movement everyone has to be involved if it's just sort of the oppressed class fighting about things it's sort of tuned out you have to get everybody involved to really um make a difference so we think it's really important again it's it's not just women that are suffering under under sexism and Another thing, uh, not just women, um, sort of two two uh, two strands to go in here. One is the, is cause, mm -hmm. and I see in much of your work 
a notion of cause, of, of mission that, that seems to, to drive you in many mm -hmm. of the things that I've seen you uh, involved with. Um, so that, that on the one hand, there's, uh, there is that notion of cause. On the other hand, I see um, you mentioned that you do marketing for organizations, mm -hmm. for, presumably for businesses as mm -hmm. well as perhaps nonprofits, but, but businesses. And uh, within, the, within the business world, uh, simply selling products and not, I think these days people have more of an, seeing more of an affinity between mm -hmm. cause organizations and, yeah. um, and business. But how did we get here? How did, we, how did you get here mm -hmm. in terms of a cause-related uh, organization and, yep. and your background? Yeah, well... <laughs> It's, it's been a long and winding road. Um, really my last sort of corporate um, technical job, job, uh, career type job that was not aligned with specific causes or political organizing was in the marketing world. So I worked for a couple of different marketing agencies. Um, and that was, that was really a different time when I didn't really think a lot about, um, I did, I always did a lot of volunteering and activism outside of work, but I didn't, I didn't really know that it could align so much with my day job. And so I was feeling that sort of friction between like believing really strongly in what I did outside of work and then going to work and working on behalf of companies in some cases that I really didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. Um, and specifically I, I wrote about, um, a particular client that the last agency that I worked for had, which was a gun company local here to New Hampshire, Sig Sauer. And I was really, I was hesitant at first, but not completely against it. I didn't really know where I stood on that until I started working on that client and, and reading that type of language every single day. It was really um, damaging to my, my mental and emotional state. Um, and that was, that really pushed me into a place where I had to really think about like, what do I want to spend my time and energy doing? Does it matter mm -hmm. that much um, to me, you know, to stay in a particular job under a particular job title? Um, so I ended up really coming to grips with that and quitting actually the day after the Orlando shooting. I was, mm -hmm. I was really already in a place where I was being forced to make a decision between like, do you want to continue doing community work or do you want to keep this marketing job? Um, and when that shooting happened, it was just, it just made the decision like immediate. I went in and I quit the next day. I was like, I can't, I can't work for a company anymore that supports this company that is involved with marketing guns for things like that. And I found out right actually, right after I quit that it was actually that manufacturer that I had been working on that mm. manufactured the gun that was used in that terrible mm -hmm. incident. Mm. So I was really grateful that I had left already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but at that point it was like a flip switch. I was just like, I'm not, I can't work for things that I completely disagree with anymore. And I think, um, I hope that a lot of people have a moment where that becomes clear to them. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is in a privileged position. A lot of people have families to support that can't just quit their jobs over something that they believe like that. But I was, I was lucky that I, you know, I didn't have other people relying on me. It was a decision I could make. I was like, look, I can always go back to coffee shops. There's nothing wrong with that. I've always loved, I've gone back to work at coffee shops in a few different career iterations. Mm -hmm. So I sort of just felt like there's, you know, it was an easy decision at the moment, although it was a terrifying thing to do I at bet. the time. But as, a, a as leap, soon as I quit that job, faith. I was like, okay, like I feel like I have my life back. And ever since then, really, I've been just really clear that I'm not going to work for things that are problematic. In fact, I really put it out there and make it obvious. This is what my values are. These are the types of causes I like to support. And I have found that more people are actually attracted to work with me who see a really strong alignment than somebody who might just be offering a similar service that I would offer, mm -hmm. but isn't really clear on where they stand on issues. So, And yeah. you keep this notion of, uh, of business, of not seeing this as a cause to change people's opinions, although I think that's a, a key, it seems to be a really key motivation, mm -hmm. but you maintain this notion of doing good, of, of doing this work in the context of, of businesses. Mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, and certainly in the film world, there was this notion that you know, you're, you're just trying to get people to watch your stuff. Don't worry about the message. Mm -hmm. It's really just about entertaining people, about characters entertaining people. And I think many people have, have looked at There's a lot more 
to it, that that's one of the reasons why people come to it. And I think perhaps in, mm -hmm. we could make that stretch to business as well, that there are many people, many different kinds of businesses. But why the focus uh, that, that I think is maintained in, mm -hmm. in businesses? Is it to change businesses or is it a, a unique opportunity with uh, working with businesses? That's, that's a good question. So I also sort of in between Feminist Oasis and that marketing career, I also did um, a period of time in political organizing during the mm -hmm. 2016 campaign. So I was working in politics at that time, which I think is incredibly impactful and is certainly another way that I've always sort of brought volunteering into it. Um, I think what's interesting about coming at it from a business perspective is when you're around um, a mentality that business is opposed to values or, or you're around people who think you have to, if you're a professional, your you have to completely at the door. <laughs> not show up to work. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting challenge to then work in politics and then realize, you know what, I could actually bring the same connection to my values into work because people are people. If something's going to resonate politically, those same people are the people running businesses. Not everybody feels like they can put, you know, maybe things that are considered political stances into their business, but, mm -hmm. you know, wherever that line is, whether it's just, you know, we support the environment, like think about a company like Patagonia, like really putting it out there that like, we exist for this mission, we're, we're actually, you know, they registered as a B corporation, so they're really a social driven business. Mm -hmm. um, and another company is Starbucks. I worked at Starbucks for years and that there's a company where, you know, the CEO, Howard Schultz was really into, um, supporting same-sex marriage and or same-sex um, benefits for same-sex couples. So before that was before marriage was legalized in most states or or really any states. I think this is just when domestic partnerships were starting to be recognized in a few states. He just made it across the board that his businesses offered health benefits, um, you know, gym membership benefits, all the benefits that you get working at a Starbucks, which um, he's always been like really pro heavy on the benefits if you work there even 15 hours you get full medical you get you know education reimbursement and all that stuff and so people like that really inspired me to think of why well, you don't have to wait for legislation to happen so mm -hmm. if we're not winning on the political side you can take you can take more ownership in what you're doing on the private side because that's you know that's sort of what these business structures were set up to do and, and people on the more conservative side are, are a lot more pro that type of an idea, like doing things one business at a time or doing things mm -hmm. on a local level. So it was really sort of seeing, you know, the political side and then seeing the business side and just sort of like, yes. I don't know, those two ideas sort of rubbing together. And presenting, you're, you're just, you know, nicely segueing into an, another strand of your work life, which is, which is political campaigns. Mm -hmm. And campaigns maybe we could even think of them as as marketing yeah. campaigns um but specifically you worked on uh one particular political campaign mm -hmm. uh, relatively recently uh how does that figure into uh into this intersection yeah a lot <laughs> so the 2016 campaign was very uh important in my life as it was to many others i worked for hillary clinton and the democrats in the 2016 campaign here in New Hampshire. Um, and that was, it was big, you know, A, in that I went from doing something that I completely felt conflicted about and terrible about to, you know, a month later I was working for a campaign that I like fully 100% believed this is the most important thing I'll ever do in my life. Um, so that sort of switch to go from something that you don't believe in at all to something that you completely believe in and want to spend 100% of your time doing. Um, and also, I think the loss at the national level of that campaign, although we won a lot of New Hampshire seats, obviously, the presidential candidate that I was working for didn't win. And so, again, I feel like that maybe pushed me into thinking, okay, there's not a lot on the national level that we can really do, maybe for a couple of years, at least. So let's, let's look local at what we can do. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that was that was a big push into thinking about things on a more local level and a more maybe business sector focus level. And coming full circle, putting those strands together with uh, Feminist Oasis, um, 
and returning to this idea of creativity and mm -hmm. finding creativity. Oh, actually, one more thing that, that is another strand important to, uh, to, to hear, which is that we are in this, we are in some city, we are in mm -hmm. the, uh, also in the city of Summersworth, yep. and you found your way here as mm -hmm. I found my way here. What is it about this kind of a city, this kind of a place that, uh, that brought you? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I was I was born in Portsmouth, and we sort of lived around in Kittery and Elliot in Portsmouth growing up. Um, and I moved away a couple of times to Tennessee for a few years, to Hawaii for a few years, and I always really missed the Portsmouth Seacoast area, Portsmouth in specific. So I moved back about 10 years ago to Portsmouth, and a couple years ago, really right around uh, the campaign, um, I had to find another place to live after that because I had moved and I was, you know, living in the area that I was organizing with during the campaign. Um, so after that, I really had to be like, oh, I have to find a place to live now. <laughs> uh, Portsmouth has yeah. gotten very expensive. Let yeah. me look at some other options. Um, and so, you know, I had a friend that lived here in Summersworth and she was like, look, uh, there's it's a month to month lease right now. So mm -hmm. it didn't feel like a huge commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, all right, I'll try. I'll try Summersworth for a little while. Um, I loved the apartment. I loved just this neighborhood. We've got Teetotaler Cafe right here, which is like the most important thing to me is that there's a coffee shop nearby. That's that's really a great place to hang out. Mm -hmm. um, so between that coffee shop and the very pleasant setting of the apartment, I think I that's what got me here. Um, what has kept me here and has really reignited it a real excitement for this particular city is um, observing what happened in Portsmouth over the years so much art and creativity and culture there it continues to grow um you know that has also affected things like affordability and stuff like that but there's there's a lot of that that's that's in Summersworth also and in Dover and a lot of places in between so coming here and seeing you know that same vibrancy but a way to sort of get in earlier really before the town um sort of outgrows you or out out prices a lot of people who are still able to do creative things i know a lot of people that are moving into summersworth um partly because of affordability um and it just causes such a huge opportunity i think things are more accessible here um so people can go out on more creative limbs and start cool things like mm -hmm. some city yeah <laughs> yeah it it that affordability is 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 key and a most unencumbered quality um, that's that's here. A mm -hmm. uh, in the green sector, which I did a lot of work in in the past. There's the notion of the laggards become leaders when you don't have you haven't built up uh, as much infrastructure as some other places. It means it's a little easier to. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to, to rebuild or to uh, adapt what's mm -hmm. already here. Yeah. And I have found, I found it to be just, just such a welcoming and wonderful city. I've been really excited about a lot of stuff I've seen on the local Absolutely. level here. It just, yeah. It's a great city to be a part of. <laughs> so what, what do you see as the, uh, the future of uh, Feminist Oasis and your, uh, and, and your work in general. And, and one other strand that, that I might mention is that you had uh, programmed, worked with the TEDx Talks mm -hmm. in Portsmouth for, for quite a few years as, as you yeah, really yep. built that into a, 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 you know, a terrific uh, a terrific event that people look forward to each year. Yeah, that was a really exciting project. So I was I was brought in on the first, you know, with the first few organizers there that first year. Um, I was one of the co-organizers, and after that first year, you know, it's a it's a lot of work to do that event. Mm -hmm. So really, everybody else took a backward step and said, "All right, well, if you want to keep it going, go right ahead." So I I've had a few different co-organizers over the years, but. Um, I finally did that backward step myself this year after seven years and, um, you know, we took a couple of years to plan the first event. So we've had six, six successful events, um, started off as TEDx Piscataqua River. We got the much fewer cues name of TEDx Portsmouth <laughs> this year, which ah, was really exciting. Yeah, yeah. The UK, uh, event was really gracious and they handed over the website and the, all the social media stuff for their TEDx Portsmouth name. Um, so it's a lot easier to spell now, but yeah, that, that event was <laughs> yeah. a lot to organize every year, but it was really, really exciting because we got to see, you know, from the start of the brainstorming of who's going to be our speakers this year, mm -hmm. we would just constantly hear about 
really cool people in the region that were doing awesome things. And one of the cool things that TEDx makes you do really as a rule is you can't really focus too narrow on any one group of subjects. They want you to be like all over the place and have people talking about health, talking about technology, inventors, scientists. I mean, it can't really be focused just on the type of TED Talks I think people think about a lot are the sort of motivational stories. Um, you can have maybe one or two of those, but really um, they want you to mix together this really eclectic mix of different types of speakers so that no matter who's showing up to your event, you know, if you're a business person, if you're a philanthropist, no matter what it is that you focus on, there's going to be a talk that really relates to you. Um, and that was a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, and even outside of the speakers, just running an event of that size and, and getting, you know, raising all the money for it and getting mm -hmm. it catered and like all these, all these different elements um, were really helpful. And I did uh, organize the Pride event two years ago as well. So sort of running these big events started becoming a thing that I had a lot of expertise on. So that, you know, goes right into Feminist Oasis. I was like, yeah, events organizing is really, <laughs> that's really where my mind goes. If, if, if a challenge comes up in the community, I always go to, we must have an event about this. Um, I also started the series, it became a series, it was a single event at the time, uh, called the Let's Talk series at the Music Hall Loft um, around the heroin e epidemic. It mm. was, you know, something that was just in the news a couple of years ago, really mm -hmm. starting to get really big in the news, although, as we know, it like it had, it had been going on for a really long time, but um, yeah, I always go to let's get a panel together of, of experts in various aspects of this thing and talk about it. Um, so that was another series of events that we did. We talked about poverty as well after that and, and um, screen time for kids and technology and uh, the health impacts of that. But yeah, I think, I think events are always going to be a key part of Feminist Oasis, sort of mm -hmm. to answer your question about the future. Um, I think we're really we're really getting deep into the business side. So really undermining, um, thinking about the underlying structures of a business and, you know, where do, you know, white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy and all these, all these sort of like big words that go into like how systems are set up. How do these things affect our businesses? Even if we think, oh, I just wanted to start a business and I'm doing it. Well, there's a lot of structures in place and hierarchies and just the way things are done that we might not think um, is excluding certain people from our business or from our client base. And so really getting businesses to think through um, how they include everyone in their business, um, both on the team side and on the client side. Um, if they're using language that's inclusive to everybody, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with diversity and inclusion on your business, is there something maybe that you're putting out there that you don't realize that you're doing? So we're, we're really, um, focusing on getting that, um, corporate business focus into our offerings of really going into larger businesses. Right now, we're really thinking through that on a, like a freelancer and a consultant level. So our co-working sessions, we have a lot of small business owners, people that run, their own company, maybe it's a company of one, maybe they have a few freelancers or a few employees. Um, and so they're really empowered to make these changes and it's it's not a huge turning of the whole ship type of thing they have to do. So we've, we've had a lot of these conversations on smaller levels. So the future for us is really talking to the bigger companies, institutions of higher learning, local governments, the, the bigger systems that are mm -hmm. in place in our communities and seeing how we can bring this sort of feminist equality type of lens to how they're doing mm. work. Mm. Just thinking of um, how the creative economy, um, thinking of the the events you've inspired and um, your, your goals, how the creative economy can mm -hmm. uh, dovetail with that. Uh, seems to me, uh, again, a real promise of a place like this that, that, that feels like you can get things started mm -hmm. quickly and, uh, and, and get some steam behind it. Um, how, that, how that plays out remains for, the, <laughs> remains for the future, but I really look forward to seeing how, and, and, and how Feminist Oasis grows and, uh, and your other work, too. Mm -hmm. with, with Do you see your work with um, 
with with businesses as part of the feminist oasis or is that separate consultancy that's definitely part of feminist oasis so mm -hmm. that's really what so our mission is to is sort of twofold the events part is the cultivating feminist community and creating these fun events for people to sort of come together and the other part is exploring feminist values in action when it comes to sustainable models of business, mm -hmm. activism, community, stuff like that. So that's really a, a main focus of Feminist Oasis is on the on the business level right mm -hmm. now and, and looking forward to, you know, higher education and government, different sectors like that. But um, I think that's where there's a lot more potential for um, change that can be realized in a in our lifetimes mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to go in it in into it on an individual level I mean it, this is such a culture where um, you know the free market so to speak is is a thing or at least a concept that people believe in um, so to to try to look at entities that are empowered to make their own decisions and not necessarily wait for you know legislation but like maybe a business can look at equal pay mm -hmm. and, and make those changes that they need to inside their business before something like that can be legislated on a state or federal level. And I know when we spoke last week, we had talked about the idea of the workplace itself, the culture of the workplace mm -hmm. itself, and, uh, and making that a just a better place, a place that's more fun, mm -hmm. that... Uh, I tell my students that producing stuff, making stuff can be really fun. That can yeah, be energizing yeah. and having a place that's more effective mm -hmm. in making stuff or creating stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's a more fun environment. It's a more effective environment. Yeah. And just thinking about like how, how your workplace is set up to support your physical body. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. if you, if you look at, if you asked um, women or feminine presenting people to design an office, it would probably look a lot mm -hmm. different from the offices that have been designed by men for men for generations and generations. Um, there was a recent article that just came out that I shared with a few people and then a few people separately emailed me about it. So I know it's making the rounds right now about designing cities for, for safety of women walking around. What if women's mm. were designed? Mm -hmm. What if um, cities were designed to protect women or, or for women's safety? And just sort of the movement now, you know, architecture is so heavily dominated by men currently, although there's a lot of women going through architecture school, so they're really looking at that as an industry. Why aren't women sticking around in this industry like a few others that have this issue? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when things are designed by women or, you know, feminist-minded men or, you know, insert, you know, person here that's not already represented in, in realms of power mm -hmm. historically mm -hmm. in this culture anyway, mm -hmm. um, and things could look a lot, a lot different. Well, good. We'll, we'll have a workshop here to, to make this yeah. a more fun and <laughs> vibrant and exciting, exciting place. And invite businesses in the area to, to speak with you, to think of how they can make their businesses better, more, more effective. Yeah. So uh, the best for Feminist Oasis for you, for this community. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks for coming over here today yeah and, thank you and thanks for leading the way <laughs> thanks all right so we will see you next time on the creators of some city remember to thumbs up if you're so inclined subscribe yes subscribe <laughs>